Good morning, church. Great to see you out today. If I were to ask you, who would you say, if you had to pick somebody, who is or was America's pastor? Who would you say? Graham. Billy Graham, right? All of us. All of us would say Billy Graham. This was Pastor Steve's hero in the faith, the, the, the giant of giants. And he was sought for wisdom and counsel and prayer from celebrities to famous people to every president going back to Eisenhower. Can you believe that? And he lived to 2018. 100 years, 99 and a half years he lived. And there was just something amazing when Pastor Steve went to be with the Lord last week. And I knew that that was his hero. I can almost guarantee you, after seeing the Lord and a few other people up there, he ran to find Billy Graham. And those two are probably having a conversation right now, discussing theology and all the great things and worshiping the Lord together. When Billy Graham was 92 years old, starting to struggle with Parkinson's, he scaled back his schedule. And on a month in January, a month before his 93rd birthday, the leaders of his hometown in Charlotte contacted their favorite son. They said, would you please come to this luncheon? We just want to honor you. We just want to celebrate you. You know, why do we always wait for people to be gone when we say all the great things about you? You know what I mean? Like, can't we say them to each other? And so Billy Graham uh, uh, was initially reluctant. I don't want to come. I don't want to make a fuss over it. I've got Parkinson's. I'm having trouble walking. It's, it's, you know, I'd rather not. And they begged him. All these wealthy businessmen said, you are Charlotte's favorite son. Please come. You don't have to talk. You don't have to give a major address. You don't have to do anything. Just come and let us celebrate you. Just come and let us love you. So reluctantly, he finally agreed. And he came and leaders got up and spoke and shared all kinds of wonderful, true things about Dr. Graham. And finally, he actually got up. He stepped to the podium. He looked at the crowd and he said something very strange. He said, I'm reminded today of the great scientist, Albert Einstein, the physicist who just that month apparently had been honored to be put on Time Magazine as man of the century. People were looking around like, why is Billy Graham up here of all day talking about Albert Einstein? And he said, I want to tell you that Einstein was once traveling on a train and the conductor came down the aisle and began punching tickets of every passenger. And when he came to Albert Einstein, the great scientist reached into his vest pocket to pull out his ticket, but his ticket was gone. And he kind of panicked. He started patting his vest pockets, then his pants pockets. He started looking around. He opened his briefcase. He couldn't find it. He looked at the seat next to him, and he couldn't find it. And he, he began to panic. And the conductor looked at him and very famously said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. And Einstein nodded kind of appreciatively. And the conductor continued down the aisle, punching tickets. And as he was ready to finish that car and move to the next train car, he took one back, backwards look, and he saw the famous scientist was now on his hands and knees, looking under his seat and other people's seat, frantically trying to find this ticket. And the conductor's like, what is this guy doing? So he ran back and said, please, Dr. Einstein, get up, get up. It's, it's no big deal, right? I'm sure you bought a ticket. I know who you are. We all know who you are. To which Einstein famously said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. It's a, <laughs> it was a true story. It sounds kind of funny. It was a true story. And look, and people listening to Billy Graham relay this story at one of his last public pronouncements were kind of baffled. And then he changed gears and Dr. Graham says, I want you to look at the suit that I'm wearing today because it's a brand new suit. Here's an actual picture of the suit he wore on this particular occasion. He said, my kids, my grandkids began teasing me and telling me, you have gotten a little slovenly in your old age, Grandpa. You used to be more fastidious. And so, shamed into it, I went out and I bought a brand new suit for this luncheon and for one other occasion. Do you know what that occasion is? This is the suit that I will be buried in. But when you hear that I'm dead, I don't want you to remember this suit that I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. Man, you could hear a pin drop. Billy Graham leaned forward and he says, I not only know who I am, I know where I'm going. Much of our lives is spent wondering which ticket to punch. How great would it be if we don't have to worry about why we're here or where we're going? And man, even at advanced age, Billy started to preach. He started to get wound up. And people could see that fire come back in his life. He shucked it down to the cob with all these wealthy businessmen. are like, there he is. He literally can't help himself. He's going to talk about Jesus. 
And then he said, you know, these business leaders are fully self-aware, but some of them are clueless concerning their ultimate purpose and their standing with a holy God. Boom. And there it is. Why are we here? That's how we began last week. What is our ultimate purpose? Last week, I asked you the question, why are you here, not in this room, but why are you on earth? What is our purpose? Or if you wanted to pull back and, and whisper it in a grand way, what is your chief end? What is the highest goal? Why are you here? For those who know Christ, living with purpose should be our norm. But sadly, for so many of us, it's not. So we looked at the Apostle Paul, a great faithful servant who showed us how to live a life of purpose, even in the midst of struggles, even when things are going well, even when we're at a crossroads, like, God, where are you? I've got this, don't you hear me? I've got to pick a path. I've got time, is to, right? So Paul made it crystal clear. Our main purpose as human beings is to live our lives not for ourselves, but for something greater, something much beyond ourselves. And something that Paul shows us is that when we seek first and foremost to bring glory to God, it's our lives that are blessed as well. What a great twofer, a two for one. God's glorified and our lives blessed? Yes, please, sign me up for that. So today we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1. You can go ahead and pull it up. We'll read the whole passage, and then I want to break it down verse by verse. I'm going to read from the ESV, and while you get that up, let me welcome our online guest. Great to have you with us if you can't be here in person. And if you are a guest in this room and I haven't met you, I would love to meet you and shake your hand after service. Please come up and find me. Uh, I'm Pastor Matt, by the way. Great to meet you all. Philippians chapter 1, everybody got it? Starting in verse 12, follow along. It says this. I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is because I have done some illegal things. My imprisonment is because I have embezzled money from the emperor. My imprisonment is because, like, I had an affair with Caesar's pap. No. My imprisonment is because of Christ. Do not forget that. Okay? This is going to come home to us. My imprisonment is because of Christ. Everyone here knows that. For most brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, they're much more bold now to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What does that mean? What a bizarre statement. We'll come back to that. So what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Yes, I'm going to say it again. I will rejoice. So you remember from last week that when our core purpose is to bring glory to God, we find our identity is in that. It's not in what we do. It's not in our career path. It's not in who we know or where we came from. It's not in our heritage. It is in who we worship. And when our life is all about the one we worship, everything else just kind of falls into place. All these distractions, all these things that are vying for your attention seem to fall by the wayside. When we know why we're here and we dedicate ourselves to living out that purpose, that purpose begins to define who we are. And that was our first truth grenade last week. It's our purpose that defines who we are. Remember, Paul's in prison. He's shackled probably to a smelly guard, sitting in a rotting jail cell with people who haven't bathed, all the joyful trappings of, of prison life, and he's there, and he says, guys, guess what? All this stuff is to advance the gospel. All this, he has such an incredible, he literally says, it's fulfilling my purpose. And that blows me away because he doesn't say what I would say, which is, man, this really stinks. Here I am, out trying to do the Lord's work. Don't you know, Lord? And now I'm sitting in jail. Really? When that, that guy over there, that mean guy, that pedophile, that, that murderer runs free, I'm sitting here, I'm the one shackled to this dude? Where are you, God, when I need it, right? See, that's what our flesh would say. That's, Paul doesn't say that. Instead, he looks at his circumstances, and don't miss this. He says, God, how can you use this to be glorified through me? Wow. Who does that? Well, mature followers of Christ are supposed to. This is where the rubber meets the road. I love that he doesn't define his life by his circumstance or what's going wrong. He defines it by living for something greater than himself. 
He defines it not about his own life, but about what it will do to bring glory to God. And that brought us to our next truth. Purpose directs our next steps. This is what directs our future path. When I know why I'm here, it helps me know where I'm going with my life, how I will deal with whatever life hands me. It's kind of like purpose gives us that Christian road map, or for those of you who are really technical savvy, map quest. Ten years ago, I know. If you were here a couple uh, years ago on a Wednesday night, I think I shared this incredible story about the Navy SEALs, and they have this phrase, always keep one foot in the water. Why do they say that? Why do they whisper that to each other? Always keep one foot in the water. You know why they say that? Because they know no matter what enemy they're facing, the SEALs are confident that if they can just get back to the water, they're going to have the advantage. They're going to have the advantage over their enemy because they have trained to thrive in that situation. Oh, you getting this? They have trained that if they, as long as they have one foot in the water, the enemy, to them, that's dangerous. That actually could be fatal. But to them, this is where they thrive in that environment. Church, think about that. The presence of God is to us as believers like water is to the Navy SEALs. For us, the presence of God is where we thrive. That's why Sunday mornings are the highlight of my week when our worship band takes us into the presence of God and we can just cast our cares on him and put aside all this baggage, all the junk we brought through that door. And we can just be in his presence and we can just bask. And it's like time stops. You notice that? Because that's the presence of God. We've got one foot in his presence. And the moment that we retreat to his safety and that presence, it's all those discouraging lies die. All that hopelessness, all that purposelessness that we see being thrust on our kids, that you're just an accident. You kind of just happened and, oh, well, do your best. And we wonder why they have no core, no esteem, no God center. There is hope for your situation, but you have to know the purpose maker. You are not an accident. We're not alone. There is a purpose. You and I are here for a reason. So what was Paul's purpose? Well, check out verse 12. Look at it with me. It's in the last three words. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. There it is, right? Notice again, he doesn't say, God planned all these bad things to happen for me. He's a mean God. I'm sitting here in jail. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been flogged. I've had a thorn in my flesh. I've asked him to remove. I've had snakes bite me. And instead, he says, all these things have taught me in tough situations. My job is to advance the gospel because it's not about me. Just take a minute with that. Is that a popular sentiment in our world today? It's not about me. Goodness, the whole world says it's all about you. Not only is it about you, it's about your feelings. You know how I feel about those feelings. It's like, does your feel, no, your feelings lie. It's all about the truth of why we are here. And I love that Paul doesn't dwell on it. And the, we saw that, that his next thing he teaches us is our, our purpose will testify to our faith. When we're living out our purpose, trust me, people will notice. It will testify so loudly to others about your faith in Jesus. When Paul was in his prison cell, his purpose was evident to all. Look at verse 13. He says this, it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, and to everyone else, all the rest, that my imprisonment is because I did bad things and I'm a wicked person. It's not what he says. It's because of Christ. And you remember, I said, how did they know it was for Christ? How, how did he know? How did everyone know in the whole palace, the whole imperial, that he was there because of Jesus? Because he was bold. He was fearless. He knew his purpose was to bring glory to God, and he wore it proudly. Remember, we talked about that, like that great 1980s jean jacket vibe, and he had this purpose, this garment, and everyone knew, and he was unashamed, and he was fearless. Man, I get it. It is so tough to stand up in a world that wants to throw stones at you when you stand for righteousness. We all feel it. All right, so if you miss the last, the last session, you're all caught up. The next truth we see from Paul today is this. Purpose equips others for ministry. It equips us, and it equips others for ministry. As we've already seen, living out your purpose will be a testimony to the unchurched. I think we all get that. But what Paul's saying here is it will actually be a testimony to those in church. It'll be a testimony to you, to me. Your presence will encourage people, those who are in Christ, already part of God's family. Keep going. Look at verse 14 with me. See if you can notice something here. And most of the, what's that word? 
Brothers, right? Most of the brothers. So he's already saying these are, they're in the family. They've become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, and now they're much more bold to speak the word without fear. Yeah, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. That's cool, whatever. But others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Guys, these are two drastically different reactions to the gospel. Do you think about that? Paul's imprisonment by those who claim to know Christ, both are the same camp, but yet Paul's example encourages one. And they make a much bolder stand for Christ than they were previously. Paul knew his purpose was to be unafraid. And what happened is it began to spread to these other believers. It began to spread almost like a contagion, and they became unafraid. And they said, yeah, look at Paul. He's doing that. When we come together and we link arms, they encourage each other. You see that. There's a great quote by Billy Graham. He says, when courage is courageous because brave men, they stand up, and what happens is the spines of others are often stiffened. Have you noticed that? When somebody takes a bold stand, you're like, they can do it. I'm with them. I get it. And as we look around and the days get darker, and things seem to just, hearts are growing colder, every one of us probably sense the rising antagonism towards your faith. I get it. We see it. Churches that were once welcome to rent public schools and pay good money for it are now finding the doors closed. That's why we have so many meeting here when we we leave. Bible studies were once free as long as other things. Now they're kicked off camp, but yet every other club, every other perversion can be taught, even celebrated. But do you bring up the name of Jesus? Oh, no, 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 no. That's offensive. And we knew it was coming. It doesn't surprise us, but we stand bold together, right? We come together. We link arms and say, hey, I get it, man. I got your back. I know what you're going through. I've been there. Good news. I read the end of the story. (laughs) It gets worse before it gets better, but boy, does it get better. We know how this story ends. I get it, man. It is so easy in this world to just keep your head down and mind your own business. I totally, it, stay in your lane, bro. It is so easy to just take the, the quiet route and just, you know what, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to mind my own business. That pressure, that fear can feel very real. But I want you guys to hear me. Fear and intimidation is not of God. That is a tactic of the devil. And he wants you to live in fear. He wants you to be cowered into silence. This is why I often refer to fear as an acronym, false evidence appearing real, but it's not. It is fake. Fear is a liar. Don't let the enemy intimidate you. I saw this great true story about 100 years ago. Newt Rockney, y'all remember the head coach of Notre Dame. He was in a battle for, uh, to do well in, in, the, in the league, and he was fighting USC this coming week. And he read about USC, and he saw that the Trojans had a far superior team. They were undefeated. They were doing great. And he honestly got with his coaches and says, guys, we don't have a chance. We're going to lose, and we're going to lose royally. So he came up with a genius plan to intimidate the USC Trojans. Check this out. Newt Rockney went out in town, and he scoured the entire city of South Bend, Indiana. And he handpicked 100 of the most massive men he could find. If they didn't pass six foot five and over 300 pounds, they didn't qualify. Think about that. That was back 100 years ago. So that would be like 6'8 now, 350 pounds, as we've all gotten bigger. You know what I'm talking about? And he gets all these men, and he brings them onto the field and gives them all Notre Dame uniforms. Obviously, this is before eligibility restrictions and limited rosters, and he could get away with this. Y'all aren't going to believe what happened. As USC was warming up on the sidelines, throwing the ball, just checking out, here comes the 100 Giants marching in front of the real team, and they stop. And they start looking around. True story. That USC starts to have wide eyes and says, guys, we can't hang with those giants. And they began to mentally defeat themselves and prepare for the beating of a lifetime. Guess what happened? Not one of those giants was allowed to take the field. It didn't matter. They stood on the sideline, and Newt Rockney's trick had already worked. He had intimidated USC into giving up before the game had even started. Guys, don't we feel like that sometimes? 
We feel like USC when conflict comes and the battle comes and we face these things spiritually. The Bible says that as Christians, we are going to fight conflict. We are in a spiritual battle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers of this present darkness. Every time you intend to advance the kingdom, the devil wants to come and say, no, you can't do that. Let me, let me remind you of your past. The good news is the Bible is our roadmap, and it tells you why you're here. You have a purpose. You have a reason. And there is our game plan for fighting the enemy. All right, so that's one group Paul talks about. Those who were happy, those who were emboldened, those who said, I'm going to stand firm my conviction. The other group were preaching from false motives, actually working against Paul, somehow in prison, making his life more difficult. The Bible doesn't say why. I'm not sure what's going on there, but there's something at play. And I think we see these same reactions today. As we look around, we go out living our purpose, people will notice when you stand up. When you try to live God's life and you, you, you are bringing your best, do not expect the world to applaud but they should see your positive fruit. And they should have questions. And they should be noticing there's a difference between the way you live and the way your neighbor lives. So you know I gotta ask, do they? Because that's our challenge. How about at school? How about at work? Are we exactly like the world? No differentiation between holiness and living righteously and just going along with the world? How can we be salt and light if we're just like everyone else? This week, I wanted to dig deeper. So I, I backed up, and I looked at the, the, the pretext before this. And in verse 10, I found something that I, I didn't know. Paul says, I'm urging you to be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ's return. And he used a Greek word there that I was unfamiliar with. It was a Greek word called aelikrines. Very cool word that literally means we are to stand and remain pure, undefiled, and uncorrupted, literally untainted by the darkness in the world. And when I read that, it just kind of leapt off the page. Here he is. Paul is saying, you need to stand firm, church, uncorrupted, blameless, white garmented in a dark and corrupt world. And the only way to do that is if we live our life on purpose for Christ, boldly, living a life of no compromise. Imagine what this world would look like. If I lived and walked in my purpose to glorify God above everything else every day, what would your world look like? What would the city look like if churches began to change the temperature of the city rather than the city changing the temperature inside the church? I did a revival once back in Alabama, and there was one of the teenage girls. We were having one of those little uh, Hawaiian luau's around the pool, and a guy came, he finished his drink, and he threw the ice cubes into the pool. And the little girl, in all sincerity, says, oh, I can't believe you did that. Now the pool's going to be freezing cold. <laughs> and I was like, you really think those three ice cubes? And I thought, wouldn't it be great if those three ice cubes, three Christians, could change the temperature of a pool? Wouldn't it be great if you walked in a room and the entire atmosphere changed? There was a shift because the Holy Spirit was radiating. Well, you can have that. It doesn't have to be just a revival in Asbury or Sanford or Texas A&M or NC State or wherever it's breaking out. You are as close to God as you want to be. You have that joy, that privilege, that option to draw close. One of the ways I think that we want to help others grow and walk in our purpose is to discover and use spiritual gifts. So every couple of years, I like to make available to everyone a fantastic spiritual gifts inventory that you can take. And if you haven't done it, you hear the word test, and you go, oh, I don't do tests. No, no, this is awesome. This is so much fun, so revealing. It asks you questions like, okay, you walk into a room and somebody's crying. How do you respond? Do you say, A, you're a wimp, get it together? Do you say, B, hey, can you know? And it gives you these options, and you can say, oh, that one's like me, or that's not like me, right? And you go through and they ask these great questions of how to, what would you respond? And by the end of it, it helps boil down some of the ways God has uniquely gifted you. And if you haven't ever done that, it is awesome. Be looking. In the next few weeks, you're going to see a small group alert that you can sign up for. It's going to be maybe one or two weeks. I think Pastor Jason was saying that about right. We'll do a, something like that. It won't take you very long. So if you don't have a big commitment, don't let that scare you. We're going to do it. It is so revealing and will help you know and live out your purpose. Again, when we do this, God's glorified and our life is blessed. Who doesn't want that? And that brings us to our final point. 
Our purpose causes us to celebrate. Oh, yeah. So, Leanne, you said you were going to do the dance when I said it. Woo, woo. Okay. All right. There it is. Appreciate Leanne doing the slides this morning. We're here to celebrate. We're not supposed to be the ones that look like we've been baptized in vinegar, drinking prune juice, and lost our best friend. We're the ones that are, if you say it and you know it, clap, all right? Let your face be aware of it. As we go through these days, I want you to look at verse 18. Notice what Paul says. Paul's attitude. He says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. So I'm going to rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. This is such a fascinating passage to me here. Because as I look at this, notice what Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say these are false teachers. Did you catch that? He says that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. He's saying Christ is proclaimed here. He doesn't even care about their motives. He's saying, guys, Jesus is being talked about. I love how the message says it. Leah, do we have the message? Look at this translation. This is so cool. He says, so how am I to respond? I've decided that I really don't care about their motives. Whether mixed, bad, or indifferent, every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. <laughs> so I just cheer him on. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to keep that celebration going because I know how it's all going to turn isn't that great? What an awesome perspective. The kingdom is still being advanced, and there it is. Paul's purpose is to glorify God and bring people to know the Lord and bring as many people as he can before he goes. And isn't that every believer's goal? To take as many people with us as we can, our family, our loved ones, our neighbors. Paul's saying, guys, all this bad stuff's happening. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to see, God, how are you going to work through this to glorify you? And that is so foreign to most people today. Sadly, even to most believers in the church. When we live with such a focus. So as your friendly neighborhood pastor, you know, I got to ask, how are you doing with that? With that mindset? You know, when I think about being committed to a purpose, my mind goes back to the amazing true story of World War II of Second Lieutenant Hiru Anoda. If you haven't heard this story, it is amazing. All right, I'm going to have our band come up, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. He was an imperial intelligence officer in the Army for Japan. He fought in World War II. Most of his career, he was shipped off to fight in the Philippines. What makes his story so incredible to me is that when the war ended, Anoda refused to surrender. In fact, he refused to surrender so much, he was one of several Japanese holdouts that refused to surrender, even though the war ended in August of 1945, he said, I will not surrender, get this, unless I receive word from the emperor himself or my commanding officer comes and says, you can leave your post. Guess how long Anoda stayed fighting a war that was over? 29 more years. 29 more years. This is a historical anomaly. There was another guy with him there. It was 1974, and an explorer was going through the Philippines woods, came across this Japanese soldier who refused to believe that the war was over, who thought people were tricking him. And he said, I will not surrender. I don't care what you say. You're a trick of the devil. And I am going, unless I hear my commander in chief come and say, you can leave your post, I will not abandon my mission. This is incredible. So this explorer heard this, went back to Japan, found his retired commander. The retired commander heard about the story, found an old uniform, hopped on a plane, went all the way into the woods of the Philippines, and personally came to him and said, Sir, you are relieved from duty by order of Emperor Showa. It was 1974. There's an actual photo of Anoda surrendering his sword in this moment. He finally, at long last, completed his mission. Y'all, you want to talk about commitment to a purpose? 29 years after he could have walked off, he refused to surrender until his commanding officer came and said, job, well done, you can, you can step down now. Clearly, this is a man who knew his purpose. You know, and it wasn't even a kingdom purpose. It wasn't even a good purpose. This guy was so focused and tenacious on his mission, nothing would stop him. And then I look at me, and I look at the modern church, and I think how 
Anything and everything is enough to dissuade us from our mission. It's too intimidating to go across the street and talk to my neighbor and invite him to come to know the Lord. I can't do it. Oh, it's, it, it, might, it might rain. I just, I can't. You know. 29 years this guy lived in a tree because he was so committed to his purpose. And it was a wrong purpose. Yet we have the most ultimate purpose. And I think, Lord, help us. May I be this committed. So when we started this little series, I asked you a question. What is the chief end of man? When you read Paul's writings, you come to the answer this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's also the Westminster Catechism for those who like church piety. Our purpose is to glorify God by how we live. And every day you get to enjoy him forever. And it doesn't stop here. It carries on forever and ever. So let me just ask this question before we have open the altar and we sing our final song. Is your purpose to live for Christ? Is your purpose to live a life of, of worship and to spread his message so much that everyone can identify you as his follower? Is it that clear? Is it as clear as that soldier? If not, today is a great day to hit the reset button. To say, God, I am all in. I want to make truly living for you my purpose from this day forward. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me? God, I thank you for the power of your word. You are here. Holy Spirit, have your way. Bring us home, Lord. Center us on the purpose to live for you. As our highest standard, as our highest ideal, may we glorify you. Thank you for the privilege that we can enjoy knowing you every day. Speak to our hearts during this time. Help us to respond to what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with me. The altar is open. Maybe you want to come deal with the Lord. Private, no one will bother you. If you want to stand and make this your final worship song before you go take on the work week, then use that. Just whatever God has asked you to do, just be obedient to him. The altar is open. Let him speak to you now.